Hey church, welcome to Beyond Sunday. It's our last weekend in the book of James and uh, great job preaching this weekend, uh, Steve. And um, we also have Debbie Curtis with us who uh, leads all of our care ministries across all of our campuses. Glad you're here. Thank you. So uh, we're wrapping up this book that was a phenomenal series for us as a church. I really enjoyed it. Um, I love the book of James even more now. I actually wish we had more time in it. Yeah, I, but you know what? I'd rather end a series with us feeling that way. Yeah. Um, I used to preach a book of the Bible for like three years. Oh, I know. Yeah. So anyway, uh, I have enjoyed so much leading the teaching team and also the team that studies. And uh, even what I shared this weekend about uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, it was so wonderful to just read these old stories from these guys who founded it to say, no, it was the book of James. Uh, we even called our group meetings, you know, the James Club. And I had no idea. I, yeah, and it's, it's, it's fact. That's cool. Uh, now um, AA is more secular and all that, which is fine. But yeah. the 12 steps themselves, as well as the big book, are founded on the Sermon on the Mount, Book of James, and 1 Corinthians 13. So I don't know. I, I, I think that's cool because it's a, such a successful program in, in recovery. And to find out that the reason for their success are these timeless principles that mm-hmm. we've been studying for the last eight weeks. Mm-hmm. It's good stuff. It is really good stuff. And um, one of the things that I love about our church, and I've always loved about our church, is is how we prioritize care for people. And the recognition, the part of, it's built into our culture of who we are, mm-hmm. the people walking through our doors, the people walking into our community group. Um, it's, it's, yeah, they need to know things about the Bible and what God says, but even before that, it's a recognition and a compassion and empathy for they're going through stuff. Every single person walking through the doors of our and church. And you feel it. When you're on the stage and you hit a nerve, you can feel people walked in with a heavy load. Mm-hmm. And uh, mm-hmm. so uh, it's great to have these ministries that throughout the week. And it's great to have community groups that we have, that, that most of which have this culture embedded in them as well. And oh. I, I mean, I've been in groups that don't, and you, and you can notice a difference because oftentimes wh- where they err is they have a, a, an agenda of we have to work our way through this material right? Mm-hmm. that can really hold groups back when the reality is that sometimes you need to put that aside and recognize right. there's some people walking into my living room that they need us to listen, they need us to, they need us to be there with them through whatever's going on that maybe they weren't even planning on sharing with us mm-hmm. um, in this group. Yeah, you know, that's the beauty about our care teams. I mean, most of the people that volunteer within care, uh, they've been there. They've gone through that place of needing to open up and um, finding Christ in the middle of their mess and mm-hmm. getting healing from it. So it's just so amazing that they've, they've been to that place and they can easily walk with someone else through difficult times. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So um, there's there's almost three topics that you touched on this weekend. The end, you started with the end times because that's where James starts this section of scripture. And um, we don't talk about the end times a lot, but it does come up fairly regularly. And Jesus brought it up a lot in the Gospels. Yeah, uh, the church kind of tends to follow trends, and mm-hmm. it's right now not trendy to talk yeah. about the end times, which is actually why I talked about it because it was coming up. And I, I just got to thinking, how many people in our congregation say, that are coming to the services, say age 16 to maybe 25, I've never mm-hmm. heard one sermon about the end times or the rapture or what happens in the book of Revelation. And uh, so, yeah, it was kind of fun to talk about because mm-hmm. uh, I've heard about it a lot. I heard about it so much growing up that I'm not that interested in preaching about it. But, yeah, when it comes up in the text. And, and then, you know, James just says he's coming, he's returning. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about that. Let's mm-hmm. be aware of it. So. Yeah, there's a, the second coming is something we should all be aware of and know about, and it should be a, a source of hope for all of us. Yeah. Um, and, we, and, and we don't. We don't talk about it all that much, but we kind of should because I can't wait for the second coming. Yeah. I mean, what a, what a beautiful, glorious, incredible day that's going to be. And, um, and, and the prayer, prayers around that of, of – um, it just helps center us in a way that's hopeful. Well, if we were living in North Korea, we'd be studying the second coming more. Yes. If we were living in uh, as a Christian in Saudi Arabia, mm-hmm. uh, if we were living anywhere where Christianity is just not allowed, you know, they're cracking down in China now on the house churches in big ways. 
I think they're talking a lot more about come quickly, Lord, mm -hmm. because they're suffering. But we're not suffering that much, so we don't think about these things. Mm -hmm. um, but mm -hmm. it was good to talk about for a little while. Then we got into some other stuff. Yeah, so we got into prayer because uh, James got into prayer next. And, um, and, and he uses the, the phrase, the prayer of a righteous person. And yeah. he talks about the power. There's power. There's, a, there's this uh, presence of God. There's this mysterious, amazing mm -hmm. power of the prayer of a righteous person. Who, who in your life has been models that for you? You know, one of the shocking things was to, to me was when I uh, started entering into prison ministry and started visiting the men and women that are incarcerated because some of them, their prayer life, some of them literally pray several hours every day. That's part of their daily routine. Mm -hmm. So they have developed a mm -hmm. very powerful prayer life. So I actually have a friend who was in for 25 years and sometimes when I've got, I'm going through something, I will get in touch with him and ask him to pray either in person or over the phone because even as he's praying, um, I'm experiencing the fact mm -hmm. that that's what James is talking about is find somebody in your, have somebody in your life that really knows how to pray. And the old saints used to call it praying through or touching God and uh, entering the throne room. That was a cliche that was entered into a lot. And boy, the older I get, the more I value people in my life who know how mm -hmm. to pray through on a topic with mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. And we're struggling with this. Could you pray? Mm -hmm. And you know, they will. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How about you? Did you feel? Yeah, I didn't have this modeled to me too much. Um, I don't. I don't remember growing up around prayer warriors or people that I, I would identify as. Man, that they model that so well. That's just you can see they just embody it. And I honestly struggle with it as well. Like, I, it's not my go-to. Um, I'll go to two or three other things before I like. Oh my gosh, I need to pray. So you start okay, stop, fixing it. I or? start fixing it, and then I'll I'll, I'll recognize it, and I'll be like, okay gosh, it's been two days of worrying about this and I haven't even prayed. Like, and even when I prayed this morning, I was just going through my routine prayer and right. I left the most important thing that's stressing me out completely out of my prayer. Right. Until I just had to like, something knocked me over the head and I'm like, okay, mm -hmm. I need to stop everything and, and pray mm -hmm. about this. But it, it doesn't come naturally to me. How about yeah, you? Yeah, you know, prayer was always so uncomfortable for me, right? Hmm. But until I understood that it was just a conversation that I was having with God, I couldn't, I, I, I was never drawn to prayer. And so I have this wonderful guy on our um, prayer team, Bob. Mm -hmm. He'll just kind of come into my office and talk to me for a minute, and he'll say, you know what, let's just pray. Mm -hmm. And he, he's really taught me to just take time out and pray. And um, yeah, just I just love it. When I think about it being a conversation with God, it just comes natural. And um, I'm glad I can have that conversation with God. Mm -hmm. I think I've also, I, I, I've struggled with um, people in my life who have, have, it's been, it's felt forced, it's felt inauthentic, it's felt like, yeah. okay, the, they're, they're praying because they're, they're, it's the right thing to do in that moment. And cultural expectations said they pray at the beginning of the meeting, they pray before they eat, they pray before they're, and there's like this, like, ugh, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, um, it's not real. It doesn't feel real. It doesn't feel as real. Um, and so there's a, there's a feeling out of, okay, how, how do I, what does that pattern look like in my life? Mm -hmm. And it's still in process. Mm -hmm. And it's seasons of it, I think that I'm good at it. And there's other seasons where I'm not. It just kind of, it just depends. So. But J James really encourages us to retrain ourselves. And whatever, mm -hmm. he says, if, you, if you're happy, pray. If you're going through something, pray. If you're sick, mm -hmm. pray. In other words, always pray. Mm -hmm. And so if it doesn't come naturally, we, we don't leave it there and go, well, it just doesn't come naturally for me to do that. I'm not that kind of person. It's like, mm -hmm. no, you need to become that kind of person. Yeah. It's not something that's that innate in you. It's something that can be developed. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And it doesn't always have to look the same. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know that there are times when I'm in the car and I'm just kind of talking to God. And then there are other times where I'm intentionally sitting there mm -hmm. and I'm spending quiet time with him, listening. Uh, yeah. And then there are other times where it seems more formal. Yeah. So it doesn't always need to look the same. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For sure. Yeah. And then I, um, gosh, the way you ended the message in, 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 unpacking how James teaches us to confess mm -hmm. you drawing in you know the, the beauty of, of how the Catholic Church has handled this um, not perfectly and there's things where 
we would disagree, but there's also some beauty in what they've done in terms of facilitating a process of confession. Yeah, they have a they have facilities in their church dedicated to uh-huh. the confession of sin. Mm-hmm. Um, when Brynn and I travel, uh, if we can, like if we're going to the mission field and we have a, a layover, sometimes we'll stay a day or two uh, in Europe. And one of the things we love to do is to go to the old cathedrals, whether we're in Italy or uh, the UK or whatever. And uh, we'll purposely go to a Catholic church so we can go into the confessionals because let's say you're in a church that's from, say, it's been there since the 1700s, 1600s. You go into the confessional and the, the sin has been confessed in that little box for hundreds of years. Mm-hmm. And you feel, you feel it. Mm-hmm. And I'll go in there and uh, by myself and just confess sins to God because it just draws it out of you. And I think that's a beautiful thing. Unfortunately, you know, the Catholic Church went with, then the priest gives you your penance, and then you do their penance, and somehow the priest is forgiving you of sin. And, okay, that's, I think that's a little convoluted because the New Testament teaches us that we're all supposed to be a yes. kingdom of priests. But where's the Protestant version of mm-hmm. the Catholic confessional? I, where is it? And, well, uh, y- you compound that problem with the fact that in America, we're an individualistic society and not a communal society. So that means that we believe that we have a right to our own privacy mm-hmm. and that we have the right to keep walls up around ourselves and that we're going to protect what's information we feel like is ours and that it's not communal information. No one else deserves this information. And so we fall into this trap of thinking that we can hold everything in and deal with it because we're Americans and this is the culture we grew up in and it destroys us. It yeah. absolutely well, destroys us. Well, we've got a counselor us. right here. What happens if I don't get that out? Yeah. Well, it can lead to anxiety, it can lead to depression. Mm-hmm. There's so much freedom in confessing and opening yourself up and becoming vulnerable. Mm-hmm. There's power in that. You're mm-hmm. powerless when you're holding everything in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you're right. We live in a community or a society that isolates us. Mm-hmm. Social media, uh, there's not a lot of reciprocity when it comes to face-to-face conversations. And so it's easy not to confess. It's very easy to hold everything very tight to your chest. Well, it's hard to believe that there's a, I mean, everything within us is telling us to keep that secret and not tell anyone because I don't want anyone to know. Uh, But then reality tells us if we would get that out with a trusted friend or a counselor or a pastor, we could name it. And then it was what Pastor Mark taught me. Um, what, what did he say? When when you name it, it stops naming you. Yes. And instead of I am this person who does these things, I'm so therefore I'm this. It's like no, I'm a child of God who sinned in this way, and it completely redefines um, what the effect sin can have on me. Confession takes its power away. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. And I think you said a key thing. You said finding a pastor or somebody that you're safe with, like Mm -hmm. safety in a relationship, somebody that can hold confidentiality and be trusted Mm -hmm. with what you're willing to open uh, yourself up to is such an important piece. Yeah, and we've all been betrayed by a gossipy person or they just told one person or whatever, and you're like, why did I tell them? And so that also adds to the, well, I won't ever do that again. Mm-hmm. I won't ever trust again. Instead right. of, no, I just trusted the wrong person. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. A and righteous person would have been handled it well. Yeah. It, it, when, you, when you're in that place where you, you feel like, okay, I'm convinced I, I do need, I should, I probably should confess. It's really hard to feel like that's going to be good for you on that side of it. It just is because because when, when you think it through, you're like, okay, now this person knows. Now they have to carry that burden, and it's really hard to picture that feeling better. But then when we go through the process of thinking, okay, when have I confessed before? And then what happened when that happened? Mm-hmm. It almost always it, – it created this, this freedom and this life and this ability for renewal and rebirth that – we talk about suffering a lot and how suffering and trials are so formative in who we are and they, they perfect us over time. So does confession. Hmm. Um, it's right, it's right there in that same category of this is, this is one of the things that perfects you. This is one of the things that refines you Hmm. is the ability to do this. And what an honor it would be if someone came to you and said, I need to talk to you about something and I need you to never tell anyone else. 
and then I need you to pray with me mm. about it because it's not a good thing, it's a bad thing, and I need to get it off my chest, and I trust you. Mm. Mm. It's wow. it's what a compliment it is when mm-hmm. someone trusts you enough to confess to you. I mean, that's sacred. Yeah. It means it, the trust level, the, the the there's a there's a love and res- respect in that. And oftentimes I think as, as the listeners in that, we don't, we don't make sure that other person feels that, mm-hmm. um, we, we kind of feel icky or we, we can give them the feeling of shame very easily mm-hmm. based on what they might be confessing. But when in reality, like, wow, we what an I honor had, that they're willing to confess yeah, to us. I had that happen in my life and the memory's terrible. Um, there was a young woman that was very special to Brenda and I, and, uh, and, uh, we were kind of extra parents to her Mm -hmm. and she got pregnant um, outside of uh, being married and so she just called and she just she said hey I got great news I'm gonna have a baby and I was so stunned Mm -hmm. and that I didn't I didn't have the right response I didn't I wasn't condemning but I just wasn't affirming because she just wanted me to go from just hearing it to celebrating it and all I could think of is your life is gonna stink now you know you this guy's not going to be around, whatever. Well, it, her life turned out great. But she carried that scar for so long that I didn't initially react well to it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I you can apologize, but what's done is done. And, mm-hmm. you know, she was trying to sell me on being happy. Right, yeah. And I didn't want to fake it, but right. I also maybe just should have faked it. I don't know. Mm-hmm. That's um, a tough situation right but, there. For oh, reasons, my but. goodness. She told me she carried that for years that I just was, and she took it like I was condemning her or whatever, which mm-hmm. there's no way, but mm-hmm. anyway. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there is this uh, responsibility that you take on when somebody does confess something to you. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's important to be a really good listener, to not be a fixer, and first and foremost, to just love that person. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, gentle correction can come much later on. Yeah. But the, hearing something that is uh, difficult to open up to is a huge responsibility that you take on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And just to say thank you for telling me and yeah. thank you for trusting me. Right. And, and is there anything more you want to share? And I love you. Right? Oh, right. And I'm not judging you. And mm-hmm. I can't believe you told me and I won't tell anyone. And and then would you like us to pray together? And these are the things yeah. that we learn because you sit there thinking, what would I need to hear if I was telling if I was the one telling it? And what you need to hear is you're not an awful person. You're not alone. Mm-hmm. And I love you. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. How much of counseling is that? A lot. <laughs> Just being it's present, being loving, and listening. The power of being present uh, is unbelievable, right? Mm-hmm. There's so much healing involved in just listening to someone, mm-hmm. not trying to fix them, not being judgmental, and just loving them. Wow. Mm-hmm. So good. You know, as a grandparent, I'm already leaning into this with the grandkids where I'm not your parent. Mm-hmm. And so they'll, they'll tell us stuff, and you just go, oh, hmm. you know. And there's just no judgment, and then you come back around. Well, you know, what do you think about that, or how did how did that make you feel? And and then they open up. Oh, I I, I don't think I should do that again. I think that was awful. Oh, okay, well, let's not do that. You know, did you tell your parents? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. All right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's interesting. You brought that up because, you know, my oldest is 13, and so he's he's at the age where, you know, I'm I'm his dad, so. I'm the last person he wants to tell certain things, even if we've had an open conversation. Right. And, and you and wish so, like, son, but, it, come but it's to like, me. no, I'm the, I'm the best person yeah. but in his <laughs> world. Like I'm the worst person. Yeah. You can't take that personally because I'm his dad. And yeah. so the prayer has shifted to God, bring, bring people into his life that, mm-hmm. cause it's not going to be, I mean, it's, it shouldn't be me. I mean, it, it should be other people that right. God brings into his life that he's able to have that relationship with. And that's really healthy. And, Hmm. And that that prayer of, because I want it to be me, you know. It's not gonna be. No, abs- yeah. Oh, no chance. Forget it. Nor should it be. Yeah. So, um, well, thank you both. Um, there, there's so much in here for us uh, and for all of our community groups as they're as they're listening to this um, to talk about and unpack and um, and we don't need to overshare in our community groups. Um, a lot of this is is one on one and it's confession with someone who you've built a relationship with and, and that mm-hmm. trust has already been built up. And, so. and even then you have to flat out ask that person, can I trust you with, yeah. with, I'm going to tell you something. 
Can I trust you? Mm -hmm. And you know, if I could just say something about the whole book, um, if you want, go back now and read the whole book of James again slowly. And even if you want to rewatch some of the some of your favorite of the eight week series, um, I thought I look at the different um, preachers that spoke, even on the different campuses, and there was a lot of work that went into the series with a lot of love for our congregation. Um, I hope that if James was a, could be aware of us, that he'd be pleased with what we we did with his book. But um, we're moving on now, and. Uh, Starting this weekend, we're going to be talking about the death and resurrection of Christ. And uh, so that's going to be uh, such a powerful time that we're going to have together. And then after that, we're, we've got this series on fear. Mm -hmm. And we're going to talk about the things that people are afraid of and why. Mm -hmm. And how to conquer fear in your life. How God wants to help you conquer fear. And uh, so as we think about these things, do be in prayer for our congregation and for those that will visit us, that we can have a true, uh, positive, and lasting impact on their lives. Hmm. And I, I want to encourage everyone um, to invite someone to our Easter services at, at all of our campuses. Um, I read a statistic recently that, that said 2% um, of evangelical Christians have invited another person to church within the last year. That's it. Wow. And 86% of people who don't go to church who were surveyed said if they were invited, they would go to church. Hmm. Wow. That's amazing. And, uh, and the, re the surveys around that are pretty solid. And so, um, so invite people. people. People want to feel valued in the way that you thought of them and considered mm -hmm. them and found them valuable enough to say, hey, I want, I want to bring you with us to, to something I find value in mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um, have given my life to. And so let's be bold. Let's go for it. And um, let's serve our neighbors in that way. So, so here's how you do it. You take that invitation mm -hmm. that we gave you and you walk right up to your neighbor's door knock on the door, and when they open, they say, hey, this is kind of crazy, but um, if you don't have plans on Easter weekend, um, I would love for you to visit my church. And we're neighbors, and uh, if you, you, I just want you to know you're invited. That's all you have to do. Mm -hmm. And those that you work with and those that your kids play soccer with, and you just you have a few of those available, and then you just do it. Mm -hmm. And once you do it a couple times, you realize no one's offended. Mm -hmm. No one. They yeah. might say, hey, we're busy that weekend, yeah. but it's really surprising how many people say, okay, um, yeah, let me talk to my wife. And, yeah, and they may not go this particular weekend, but it's on their radar now, so it may be, it may be a year from now. Hmm. Where now, because that seed was planted and it was on their radar, it's right. more incorporated into their thinking for the following Easter and, or the and, following Christmas or whatever. And why do we want to invite people to church? Because we have something here that they can't get anywhere else. Hmm. That's it. We want them to come to our church because we love them. And that's our motivation. Yep. Amen. All right. Well, thanks for listening. We'll talk to you guys later.